Hey, hey, welcome everyone to this week's episode of the Amazon Files brought to you by Mommy Income. I am Kristen Ostrander. And I am Amy Fearman. And this week on the Amazon Files, we're going to bring you some real truth. Um, we are going to really talk to you about risky business. And yeah, we don't mean the sexy Tom Cruise movie. We're talking about the risks that you're taking in business. And we have a sad but true story to tell you about this um, risky business that we're talking about. If you're doing any kind of retail arbitrage, thrifting, online arbitrage for Amazon, you need to pay attention today. You need to know the pros and cons about selling on Amazon using these methods. And whether you're a beginner or a longtime seller, you've got to hear these stories from real sellers about what's been happening so you can safeguard your business against these terrible things. Yeah, and we're not talking small potatoes. These are real things that happen to real people, and we want to help you understand the risk you're taking. Now, risk is something that has changed and evolved over time in Amazon. Ten years ago, the risks that are that are there today were not there. So things have changed and evolved, and just because it was how it was done ten years ago doesn't mean it's how it can be done now. So we want to bring you into the sphere of the know and help you understand what makes the most sense in your business and what are the risky decisions you're making that you may not know are risky in your business. Now, before we do that, we want to invite you to become part of the Mommy Income Fold by joining our Facebook community. You can head over to mommyincome.com slash join us with the code word risky business. And we'd like to have you in there to ask your questions and get them answered. Now, when we talk about this, for those of you guys who might be, you know, could be joining us for the first time, we want to talk to you. We know that there's lots of Facebook ads and different ads and Pinterest and everything else that talks about, hey, you can sell tons of stuff on Amazon and you can buy stuff from Target and resell it on Amazon, for, for sure. Like, is that still a viable business model? It, does it still work? Well, it's not outlawed. So if that's what you're asking, then sure, it's not against the rules. It's not black hat. It's not... Um, like morally or you know legally wrong but the question is what kind of risk factor does it bring to your business now if you're just trying to do a little cash grab and you're trying to just start on Amazon and you know save up a couple thousand dollars to go to Disney World well, you're gonna need way more than that to go to Disney World to say <laughs> but if you're trying to do something like that it's not this long-term business that you want to have or it's not an actual business you're just kind of looking at little making a little chump change on the side then maybe you're not risking a whole lot. But like if you're making a legitimate business and you want this thing to grow because you quit your nine to five or you want to quit your nine to five or you want to do something from home, sustainable, freedom, time freedom, money freedom, all kinds of stuff, then you need to pay attention because you don't want to be putting your business at risk. Now, I'm going to tell a story. It's not my story to tell, so I'm not going to be using names and things like that, but this happened to what, someone we consider uh, an Amazon colleague, if you will, somebody who is in the Amazon space has been in for a long time. Um, it's, it's a, it's a multi-seven figure sales. What does that mean? That means that they don't just sell $1 million a year. Maybe it's two, three, four, five. I don't have exact numbers, but I know it's over that seven figure mark um, more over many years, okay? And so quitting the day job, this person quit their day job. They've been a seller since 2013. They quit their day job to do Amazon full time. They're doing retail arbitrage and online arbitrage. Everyone talks about RA, retail arbitrage, and like buying stuff from Target and Walmart and all these places and, and, and how dangerous it can actually be. Um, the hardest part about doing that is, yeah, it, it can seem really lucrative. Sometimes you get stuff at retail stores that are cheaper then you could even get them wholesale. And that feels exciting and it's a treasure hunt and everything else, but there's dangers. And here's the problem. This person was hit with a claim that they sold something new and it was actually used. Now, this could be no clue to you. If you go to Walmart and you something appeared new and you bought it and then you sent it in, maybe a coffee maker, and then the person that, you know, it looked brand new and sealed in the box, when you got it and then you sent it into Amazon and someone else bought it and they said, oh, this was used. There's coffee grounds in this thing and it was returned. And then someone bought it from Walmart and it just looked and appeared brand new at the time of purchase. Amazon asks for invoices. When these kind of reports come in, they suspend you and then they say, prove to me that this was bought new and your cash register receipt from Walmart is not going to do. 
they want proof of authenticity from the manufacturer, um, and whether it's manufacturer damage, sometimes that happens. Well, you can just whip out your invoice from your manufacturer that you're buying wholesale and it's fine. Your cash register receipt is not proof of authenticity. It's not proof that that item is even still new. They don't know what Walmart did to it or whatever. So it's not a via, that was not enough to prove the innocence of this item. And it's not from a legitimate source, according to Amazon, even though Walmart's a legitimate store, they're not accepting that as enough proof. So would you hang your entire multi seven figure business on this type of business model that at any time a customer can say, you said this was new, but it's actually used. And then the burden of proof is on you to prove that. And until then, your funds are being held. Your Amazon is suspended. All of your inventory is sitting there collecting storage fees and you can't sell anything to it until you prove to them that you have purchased this item from a legitimate place. Your not knowing is not an excuse for the behavior. You're still supposed to comply to the policies, whether you're familiar with them or not. That's why it's important to understand the terms and service. Now, we've heard this, this story. This seller gets suspended because they sold something that was supposedly new, but was actually used, and they got a claim on that. They have no way to prove it except the burden of proof is on them. So let's talk a little bit in depth of what it looks like when you get suspended. Your selling privileges get revoked immediately. Right? There's no questions asked, no provide us this information. It's like, nope, you're suspended. You have nothing, nothing's working for you right now. You have to give us what we're asking you for to prove that you can come back and be a seller. None of your inventory is going to show up for sale. And not only that, all of that, all of those funds that are at Amazon, you're not going to get your next disbursement or potentially disbursements for however long this goes on. And even if you do get reinstated, they can oftentimes hold your funds for 90 or more days. That's three plus months of not having dollars to spend on inventory for your business. It's, it's really scary to think about this, like whatever's it, especially if you're a, a larger seller, you think you might, I mean, some people get a little arrogant and think that they're just immune to this or that this couldn't happen to them because, oh, I'm big potatoes on Amazon. They're not going to suspend me. I make, you know, I sell 10,000, they're $10 million a year on Amazon. They're not going to suspend me. Oh yes, they will. They don't, their bots don't care. Their customer service is sometimes, now, now does it always happen on a first offense? Let's be real. Probably not but we don't know that. We also don't know what other people's seller metrics are when it comes to this, but it doesn't matter. It only takes one false move and Amazon has the right to revoke your selling privileges. It's, it's number 22, or it used to be number 22 in the Amazon terms of service when you sign up as a seller. It basically says, we can suspend your, your privileges for selling for any reason, anytime at our sole discretion. And if you speak legalese, that basically means Whenever we feel like it, we can do whatever we want to you. So we have the control and they do. It is their platform and they are the ones with this. So there's a lot of things that people don't understand. If you've never been suspended, all of these things, if you didn't have money coming into your business for 90 days, would you be able to stay afloat if you're a seven figure seller or if you're a $10,000 a month seller, like, or even less than that, would you be able to survive that? And not only do they hold your funds and revoke your privileges, even if you do get reinstated, they can hold on to a percentage of those funds for another period of time. And you may not get all of your privileges back. You may not have the account you had before. You might have category or ASIN restrictions or brand and previous um, approvals that you had revoked as part of your suspension and reinstatement. Often it takes that little offer you, you know, back in the day, Amazon didn't offer plans of action. If you got suspended from Amazon, it was literally blacklisted. Like you literally, they revoked your privileges. You could not reach out to them. They didn't have an appeal process. They didn't have, they just literally were like, nope, you broke the rules, out you go. There was no claiming, there was no like groveling. They didn't literally just, your emails went into oblivion and they literally cut you off. Now, at least now they have plans of action and appeal processes that you can do for that. But the burden of proof is still on you. And in order to get your account back, it often takes more than one appeal or more than one plan of action in order to do this. We do have an episode coming up with a, um, a 
suspension prevention kind of specialist. She does all this kind of Amazon stuff to help you with claims, to help you if you get suspended or preventing you from getting suspended by looking at your account and doing like a health checkup. So we'll have her on in a couple of weeks so that you guys can really get some of your questions answered by that because I think that's really helpful um, to think about that. But there is a way to appeal, but oftentimes it takes more than one appeal. And these are professional people that write these and they still cannot guarantee Amazon will let you on. It's all up to the, you know, Amazon to decide whether you're worthy or not. And it's just also remembering when you get suspended from Amazon, it's not big, bad Amazon picking on somebody that didn't do something. Now, occasionally there is those that the bots got something wrong and you kind of, you know, didn't do anything wrong, but most of the time it's not the case. Most of the time there was a policy that was violated. There was something that even if you didn't know you were doing, you were doing and it's still your responsibility. So your plan of action is a written document that you're bound to. So if you promise that you're not gonna do this, this, this anymore, and you're not gonna sell these types of things or you're gonna have invoices, then that means no more retail arbitrage for you. If they let you back on, that means you can't do that anymore because you promised that you wouldn't. During the appeal process, you cannot even reach out by phone ever. They will not speak to you. This team doesn't have a phone department. So it's yeah. just really, really scary. And the part of all of this that isn't even factored into this, you are still responsible for storage fees and removal fees of that inventory. If you have 20,000 units at Amazon when you get suspended, you're responsible for paying to have that inventory either sent back to you or disposed of. 20,000 units times 50 cents a unit or even 10 cents a unit for disposal, that's not small potatoes when you aren't earning any income from the business that's been, that's been suspended. So you gotta ask yourself these questions. Can, you, can your business survive without your Amazon funds for 90 plus days if this happens to you? Do you have inventory purchased via retail arbitrage or online arbitrage or thrifting or yard sales that puts you at risk in your account right now. And do you check all the items to make sure that they haven't been opened or tamp tampered with or used? There are, I mean, you can, there are thrift stores that shrink wrap stuff with professional shrink cracking wrap systems now that make them look like they are new when in fact they're actually used. And I know I hear you guys saying, oh, well, uh, how would we ever know that? Well, guess what? Target doesn't do that. You know, legitimate places like Target and Walmart and like bigger stores, big box stores and retailers, they don't usually re-shrink wrap stuff. If they have returns, then they put it on They liquidate clearance. it. And they, they say that. If this is a return or whatever it is, if it's an open box from their even their online purchase, they basically put that in their clearance section and say it's online. So we're talking thrift stores like Goodwill, Salvation Army, other, you know, savers, stuff like that, that may have had donations that then they shrink wrap because like board games, for example, the pieces will go all over the place if they just put it on the shelf. So they shrink wrap it so that the pieces don't get missing, which is great for someone who's just buying it for their kids to play the sorry game. But if you're trying to resell it and it looks brand new and then they get the package and it's got writing on the, you know, little, you know, note cards or the scorekeepers, then like they think that you committed fraud and that's your fault, not theirs. They don't care. They just are reporting you as they, someone said this was new. We opened it and it's got writing all over the inside. Oops. So they think you did that. And it's something to consider. Like you think something's like that. Do you know the difference between original shrink wrap and, um, re repurposing shrink wrap? And it might not be any different if they're using a professional grade system to do it. You might not be able to tell the difference. And that's part of the thing is like, at one point you could, if you're, if you're, let me tell you, when I used to shrink wrap things, you could tell that I did not professionally shrink wrap things. They were not well done. Um, but if you do it enough and you do it with the right system, you're not necessarily going to know if it is or isn't. So now we've asked ourselves these questions. Do we have inventory? Are we at risk? And it, I, it, guys, it doesn't matter what size your business is. It really doesn't. If you're a seven-figure seller, it hurts a whole heck of a lot more. But if you're just getting started and you get suspended, all that potential that you had in your head of where this could take you evaporates immediately. And when you're a seven figure seller, the hopes are that you have, there's more to be able to invest in getting your account back. You might not be guaranteed to get it back. This is why being able to have things in place so that you can fight them, whether you are, I always have an account that I have 
just in case I get suspended so that I can pull into that and hire somebody to help me if I need to. Like I want to get my account back sooner rather than later because it impacts me that much. So I have that saved. It makes sense for my business to have that. And it really depends on where you are. So we've talked about the scary of risky business of retail arbitrage. And honestly, 10 years ago, retail arbitrage was the Midas touch. There was no risk really in, in this regard. Over the course of time, Amazon has made changes when they've seen issues and wanting to make that buyer experience the best that it can be. So they've had to shift the way they do things. Retail arbitrage now is not what it was 10 years ago. Yes, is it still legal under the Supreme Court and all of that stuff? Absolutely. That does not mean in Amazon space that it is safe to do. Well, and this is the question that you have to ask yourself. Are you willing to risk everything that you've built for one or two items that were reported as used or IP claims or counterfeit claims? Like the, the burden of proof is on you. Even if you're like, I can't believe this. This is 100% legit. I bought it from the Apple store and I have a receipt. It doesn't, there's no guarantees. Like they might accept that, but they might not. And so there's a lot of factors that go into that. And what are you willing to do to risk it? The, the reality is that if you want to be like, the reality is that if you go to any brick and mortar store anywhere, where do they get their products? Do they go to other stores and buy off their shelves and then put them on theirs? Like you can do that for retail arbitrage or reselling or flipping and stuff like that. And I get it, but there's other platforms now, many, many platforms. Hello, Facebook marketplace. Amy and I love Facebook marketplace and we're always selling stuff on Facebook marketplace, dead inventory, or just like supplies, or even like, I literally sold two vehicles on like on marketplace. I've sold a stove. I've sold like, okay, there's places to resell stuff. So if you really got that bug, hello me, I sell places like Mercari and offer up and let go and Facebook marketplace and eBay and at one well, or not Etsy. Um, but the reality is there's all these places to sell things. If that's part of the game that you like to play, but on Amazon, on, it's not a good idea anymore because you're putting your whole account at risk just to sell that one thing that was a $50 profit that you couldn't let go of. There it's putting not only your, it's putting your whole account, but it's also putting your entire business at risk. You know, you, know, you are potentially depending on all of your eggs in one basket. If Amazon is a large percentage of, I read a story the other day of a brick and mortar store that ended up selling their brick and mortar store and focus 100% on Amazon because they were making more money there. Guess what happened? They got suspended. So all of their eggs being in one basket meant that they had no income coming in when they were suspended. So if they got reinstated, great, but they still had pain to pay for that. If they didn't, their business went under. So what are the alternatives? So we, you're like, okay, I hear you and I understand that this is risky, but you know, I'm scared. Well, the alternative is wholesale, plain and simple wholesale. Why? Because every, every brick and mortar, every retail, even online retailers, either they're hand making their own products and they're manufacturing it. Like if you own a quilt shop, chances are you're probably making all the quilts and selling them, or you're doing craft or you're doing something like that. Right. You're either manufacturing stuff yourself or you're buying from wholesale distributors with or without bundling, which we think that wholesale bundling, which is our whole patented system here, our, our trademark framework that we have that we created wholesale bundle system, we think that's best because we went from retail arbitrage to wholesale and then to wholesale bundling because there's this natural transition there. But reality is that's how everyone in the free world does business. They do business by buying wholesale. If you have legitimate wholesalers who send legitimate invoices and you have proof all the time, if you ever have issues, it's an email away. It's an email away. If you get reported as inauthentic, you can send an invoice from your manufacturer to say, yep, I got it from the source. So this is legitimate product. Or if you're getting reported used, sold as new, Nope, here's my invoice saying that I bought it direct from the manufacturer. Now, making sure you're buying it from the manufacturer and not a liquidator. Okay, this is something we see a lot of at ASD. There are a lot of liquidators there, which means they're getting rid of product, either, either overstock or liquidation. That can run you into the same risk. You are not going to have the same kind of invoices you need to get covered. So just make sure you understand what kind of source you are buying from. 
And the reality is that everyone thinks that wholesale is hard, that it's hard to do, or I'm nobody. I don't have a brick and mortar, all these different things. They won't sell to me, or I don't have a, a, an actual location, or I really don't know what I'm doing, or I don't have a whole lot of money. The reality is wholesale isn't hard. Legit, a legitimate business is all you need. And what does that mean? A reseller's license, a sales tax, sales tax certificate, sorry, I'm like, mixing up my words here, whatever it's called in your state for here in Michigan is the sales tax certificate it basically gives you the right to resell items that you bought from wholesale, whatever it is from your state. That's what wholesalers ask for. They want your business address. They want this stuff. And they basically want to make sure that you are purchasing to resell at a, at a, in sort of retail as a retailer. So that's all you need. It's not difficult. It's also not expensive. A lot of people think, oh my gosh, I can't do wholesale. That's for like the big timers. I'm like, no, actually you, we have a method for you to find a whole bunch of wholesalers by noon today. It's called mommyincome.com slash 100. It's a video that will help you find legitimate wholesalers that you can contact and reach out to right now today to start buying legitimate products from legitimate sources. And it's all about having the conversation. It's all about building relationships. That's all wholesale is. These are salespeople who want to sell their product. Pick up the phone, have a conversation. Send an email if that's easier for you to start the conversation. But putting wholesale, don't put wholesale in this, the I can't do it category. Put it in the I'm going to try it category because you're going to be surprised at what happens. I've said it a million times. My first wholesale purchase was a complete total flop. But guess what? My business at this point is 100% wholesale. And if I had gone based on that one experience, and most likely your experience, if you're listening to what we're teaching and what we're saying, you're not going to go through the same experience that I went through because I didn't have any training or knowledge to not make the mistakes that I was making at that point. So making sure that you are not putting wholesale off to the side because you don't think you can. You can do anything you put your mind to. Try it. What's the worst that can happen? They say no. Okay. Wholesale number one. They said no. Move on to wholesale number two. Well, and we're also telling you, to, this doesn't mean that you pull the plug on everything and you ha and have everything returned back from your store that you already purchased and blah, blah, blah. Like we're not trying to create a ton of fear in you. We're trying to tell you the truth so that you can make the best decisions for your business because there's a lot of hype out there, especially I've seen some, I mean, I, I'm blown away and it makes me sad inside that I'm seeing a lot of these ads and I'm seeing a lot of different things out there, blog posts and whole websites dedicated to people like starting to do this process without understanding the real risk involved. Like you don't want to spend your blood, sweat and tears and hard earned money to build up a business for all of it to just be taken away because of one bad product or two bad products. And don't think for a second that it, it's, oh, they don't hit you on your first offense. They just like give you a warning. No, this isn't three strikes and you're out. This ain't baseball. Um, it's not they, eBay. Yeah, they, they don't, they're, they're not as nice to you there. Why? Because they have a billion, billions of dollars of customers to protect. They don't, I'm not saying they don't care about you, but they do care about their bottom line and their bottom line is making customers happy so they continue shopping on Amazon. If you're a kink in their chain, they'll get rid of you because you're not following rules, but it's also protection for all of us. So those same rules apply to me as Amy, as this other person that got suspended. I wouldn't want to open a package that, that I thought was brand new, especially if I was giving it as a gift. How mortifying would that be if that person opened it and realized like, they gave me a used coffee maker? Like, how cheap is that? Like, that would be mortifying to me. And I didn't know any different because I bought it on Amazon. And if they came to me, I'd be like reporting that in a second because this is not the experience that we want. If you all want to buy used, like new, dinged box kind of stuff like that, save that for other platforms or eBay. There's plenty of places to resell and flip items. On Amazon, keep it legit. Why? Because Amazon is a, for so far, it's been a long-term sustainable business for both Amy and I over all these years. I've been selling on Amazon for 11 years and my income keeps going up and up and up. I, there's not a corporate job anywhere on this planet that I could get could triple my salary year over year and keep doing that. So it is a viable business, but you have to be legitimate about it. Chasing retail arbitrage items from store to store to store to store is not sustainable long-term, especially if you want to grow. Um, it's scary and risky. 
and I just, it's not worth it to, to me to risk my business. But do I do a little retail arbitrage? Sure I do. I just don't do it on Amazon anymore. I flip it on other places and I'm happy to do so because it gives me that little, you know, that I'm a treasure hunter. I'm a reseller. I was born to do that. But I have other platforms to risk selling stuff on so I don't risk my bread and butter, which is my Amazon account. What it comes down to, guys, is not putting all of your eggs in one basket. Um, putting all of your eggs in the Amazon basket, we see the downfall. If you build up a seven-figure Amazon business and don't have something else, well, guess what? That can hurt when you a whole heck of a lot if you get that suspension. The average millionaire has six or more different streams of income. Six or more. And that does not mean that they are managing six different businesses. They have six different ways of which they are bringing revenue into their pockets. Some of that is just compound interest from savings they have in stocks or bonds or in a savings account. That is a revenue stream. That is bringing in mon money that you don't have to go out and earn or that's, that's earning you money. Your money is earning you money called compound interest. Hello? So if you have, that's an income stream, but so is Amazon. So is maybe your spouse's job. So if you combine, even if it, you're single or you're married or whatever it is, and you combine your income streams, what are they? It could be someone's job. We actually even mean this for people's jobs. Like, it's a scary thing to, to rely on one person's source of income, even if it's one stream. So your husband or wife or whoever supports the family has one job. Well, that's always something to think about. Why do you think every financial guru in the world tells you save three to six months or more of monthly expenses just in case? Because what happens? You could get into a car wreck tomorrow, lose a leg and not be able to, to go do your job. What if you're a golf pro and you teach people how to, you know, play golf and then you lose a leg? Well, there goes your business. So the, the reality is that not putting all your eggs in one basket, especially even with Amazon, I've heard alternatives to this. I've had someone who I highly respect and admire and uh, consider even a mentor say something I don't agree with, which is, you know, hey, put all your money where the money's being made right now because you never know. You never know if it's going to come and go ride the wave while it's here. Well, I agree to that to a point. But it also mean that if what goes up must come down as well sometimes. And so spreading out your um, adventures, eventually we build one up until it sustains and then you build another one up and then you, you know, figure that out, whatever that is, because what would happen to you if that one income stream was ripped from you, whether it was retail arbitrage or an IP claim or any, any other thing that's out of your control. Um, we're not talking about disasters here though. This is something preventable. And that's why we're telling you this because you don't have to do retail arbitrage. If you're choosing to, just understand what you're doing and putting yourself at risk. We are, what our goal is with the Amazon files is to be able to bring you the truth. And the truth isn't always sexy. It isn't always good to talk about, but it is good. It's essential to talk about these things because we want to help you build a business that's sustainable for the long term that you can grow and change and evolve with. And getting suspended makes that growth and it hinders, it really hinders that growth going forward. We want to be able to have you build sustainably like we've been able to. So that being said, we want to make sure that you subscribe because we've got some other episodes coming up later this month that really will hit this home even more. We're talking to a suspension prevention professional. We're also talking to some other people who've gotten suspended or have had instances where claims have been filed against them and what they've done in that. So we want to be able to continue the story. And if you have stories, if you have been in this situation, we'd love to hear your story of how it impacted you and how you came back from that please bring that to the Facebook community. We'd love to hear those stories because we want to help celebrate or help you through the stuff points that you're in. So make sure you head over to mommyincome.com slash join us with the code word risky business. Yeah. The, the, and just, you know, coming and telling us stories and stuff like that, we want to be able to celebrate you, but we also want to be able to support you. If you're listening now and you've been suspended and you're upside down about it and you don't know what to do, um, let us try to help you as much as possible, you know, because just getting suspended and then reopening another Amazon account and starting over, that's against the rules too. They will find you out. They're the biggest search engine in the entire planet. You think they don't know about IP addresses and physical address? Like you can't hide from Amazon. Like they know <laughs> they're tracking your phone. Like, okay, we're not getting into conspiracy theories here, but the, the idea here is that like, you just, you, if you get suspended from one account, you don't just go, oh, I'll just start another one. No, that's not how it works. 
they will blacklist you. So we want to make sure that you understand the risks involved and also understand the huge benefits for doing things the right way. Doing things the right way in a legitimate way, that's how you grow and sustain and have the lifestyle and freedom that you wanted from the beginning. You don't do it by constantly putting your Amazon account at risk. You start doing things more legit and you can transition. For all those people that are freaking out now going, oh my gosh, I've only been doing retail arbitrage up until now. Now what do I do? And you know, freaking out. We don't want you to freak out, but we want you to now think about taking steps towards wholesale quickly so that you can stop putting your account at risk and start growing a more legitimate business that you can help sleep at night knowing that if something were to come against you, that you have lots of legitimate proof that you didn't do anything wrong. We want to, as always, we are here to support you. We are here to help show you the truth. And so with that being said, make sure you subscribe to the channel so that you can be notified the next time we have an episode that airs. We will see you same time, same place next week on the Amazon Files. Mm -hmm.